I, my goal is to like figure out a process, make figure out how it works, outsource it, move on to the next thing that brings in money while continuing to do the first thing. So that's what we've done with retail arbitrage. That's what we're doing with wholesale. We'll continue to do that in other aspects as well. So I think that focus and focusing on one thing at a time or just a couple things at a time has been big as well. What's going on, everybody on YouTube and on iTunes? Steve here with Rake and Profit. Back to you guys with another Rake and Profit show. And this is episode number 39 with Ryan Grant. And this guest is he's a really awesome guy. He did $3.7 million in sales in 2017 with retail arbitrage and wholesale selling on Amazon. I know he's had some TV features recently as well. And uh, he's got a lot of cool things that are happening. So we're going to kind of share his story, talk about how he's been able to scale his business to 3.7 million, which is, was it 3.7 million or 2.7? I know it was, it was high. 3.7. Yeah. Yes. I got it right. Cool. So yeah, we're going to share a bunch of tips and tricks. So welcome to the show, Ryan. How's it going from Minneapolis? It's going well, Steve. Thanks for having me. It's fun to be here. Cool, man. So awesome. Great to have you here, man. So why don't we just start from the beginning and we'll talk about your story. How did you get started? How did you you know, come into this crazy reselling world of discovering retail arbitrage and wholesale. And how did you, you know, finally get to this point where you're, you know, doing millions of dollars in sales per year? Yeah, I first got started with selling on Amazon back when I was a freshman in college. I had my textbooks that I'd purchased from the bookstore and went back to, to the bookstore to sell those books back at the end of the semester. And the offers that they gave me were offensively low, in my opinion, <laughs> enough to the point that wanted me, that made me look into other options for selling those books. And then that ultimately led me to selling them on Amazon. So all throughout college, I was selling my books. I would sell books for friends. We would sell, we, me and a buddy set up a mini like textbook buyback events. Uh, we started off doing them on campus, even ended up doing them at local restaurants, apartment complexes, things like that. We'd buy books from students at the end of each sem semester sell them on Amazon. So I did that all throughout college. Um, that was kind of my main experience selling online at that point. Graduated college and I, I majored in accounting and business administration. And then once I graduated, I took a job as an accountant working for a, a large accounting firm in downtown Minneapolis. And about, within about three to six months of working that job, I was like, this is not the path for me. <laughs> um, I was just was I wasn't like hating life, but I was just, I felt more like I was just kind of existing, following somebody else's path, as opposed to like really going for my own dreams, you could say. So that's when I like really, this was, I took that job in January of 2012. So that's when I like really started looking into other ways to make money on Amazon. So I knew I could do it with textbooks and then I wanted to explore other options besides textbooks. So that led me to going to retail stores, buying items on clearance. And that's kind of how I got started there. So I ended up working the accounting job for about a year and a half. I quit in uh, September of 2013. And now I've been running this business full time since then. I quit the job. At that point, I was making about $1,000 a month in profit working about 10 hours a week. So I was confident that if I could put full time hours behind it, that I'd be able to scale that up to a full-time income, basically replace the income that I was making at the accounting job. And then my number one goal was freedom. I just didn't like having mm -hmm. to check in with people to see if I could take time off or have to meet client demands that I don't get any upside if I work more hours, things like that. So that's how I got started all in, in most of this. And then from September 2013 to now, I've just continually been focusing on different Business models started off mainly with retail arbitrage. Then I hired a couple of people who now do that for me. That's mainly outsourced. And then now we're focused heavily on wholesale as well. So I've got myself and there's a team of about eight other people now helping me with the online retail side of the business. And I'm more or less, I work on the online selling experiment website. And then I work on some other things to help make sure the direction's on track. And most, for the most part though, my team is doing all of the day-to-day aspects of the online retail business. So that's that's the cool. two or three minute version, but happy to go into more yeah. detail on any of that. No, 
Yeah, we'll definitely be diving a lot deeper into kind of like where you are now with retail arbitrage and uh, wholesale. But to kind of uh, go back, you said that you were holding these little like book events. So you would, yeah. I don't know if you would pull up in a van or a truck or whatever, and you would, I, I, I would, I, I'm curious what, kind of like how that worked because I'm sure the, the wheels are spinning for a lot of people thinking, wow, like, you know, this is true. Like these offers that these bookstores offer are just like so offensive. Like I could set up shop and you know, there's so many people who are looking to make their first thousand dollars to maybe get into RA, to get into wholesale. Do you think that it's still possible to kind of set up these little buying events? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we've done, it's not a primary focus for my business, but we've done them as recently. We've done them within the past year and they still work. Yeah, but I mean, how I got started, there's a few twists and turns. So I don't know how far into this you want to get, but we, the first semester we did it, we were literally on campus at the bookstore. We set up a table near the college bookstore. So we would literally see students walking by with their books. Really? And basically, yeah, You're allowed to do that? We were. We had set up a club to kind of make it a little bit more legit, we set up the investments, <laughs> <laughs> the investments in entrepreneurship club. So basically we would say that we're with the investments in entrepreneurship club, we're buying textbooks and we're paying more than the bookstore. If, so we would say, we would say, if you want to go get an offer from the bookstore and let us know what it is, we'll pay you 10% more, or we can make you an offer right now on the spot. So that's how we started off. And that worked really well. And the, the bookstore actually didn't mind those first few semesters. They didn't have an issue <laughs> with it. And they actually, they actually sold us some books. They oh. had a program where they would pay at least $1 for every book that somebody brought up to them. So some of those had no value to them because they weren't going to get used mm -hmm. in the future semesters, but they had value to us because they, they were worth something on Amazon. So yeah, that's literally how we started off. We kind of ruined that. We were like, things are going well on the, at the end of the semester, we want to be, we want to get in on the action when people are initially buying their books. So we made a website that was specific to the college I went to, Winona State University in Southeast Minnesota. So basically the student could go on there, select their class, select which professor, what time it is, and then the book would show up on the website, except they would be buying it from Amazon as opposed to- Like a drop to... shipping, yeah. Yep, so yeah, it was just an affiliate site monetized with Amazon Associates. So we did that, and then the bookstore didn't want us buying on campus anymore. They <laughs> They also made us shut that site down because they said we didn't have the rights to the information to actually put that site together in the first place. So whether that was right or wrong, that's cool. I, I don't know, but we didn't have didn't have the means to try to get into a legal battle there. But then, yeah, that, from there we went to. So since as we couldn't do it on campus, then we partnered with a local restaurant that's across the street from campus. We like we bought pizza, and anybody who sold their books to us, we would give them free wow. pizza. And then, yeah, so we did that. We did similar things at a few different campuses around Minnesota. So how many restaurant. books like on average were you pulling in? Like, are you talking hundreds or thousands or like 30, 40 books? I mean, you don't yeah, have to give the um, exact numbers. But. No, I mean, we were probably, when we were at full, like when we were at multiple campuses, we were probably bringing in a, at least a couple thousand books per, per semester at, oh, at our peak. Um, Good yeah. profit margins on that? Yeah, I mean, we would look them up on a site called bookscouter.com, which shows you that. exactly what you can get paid for the book for cash right now. We would offer a little bit lower than the price on there. And then basically we blocked in a profit no matter what. And then, but what we actually do is we would sell them on Amazon. So when we're actually deciding where to sell them, we would either, if Bookscouter's price is better than what we would get on Amazon after fees, then we would sell it to Bookscouter. But most of the time we'd actually sell it on Amazon via FBA and that That's price cool. was significantly better. So yeah, the second we bought a book, we had locked in a profit. So yeah, very profitable. And depending on how much you offer, compared to those bookscouter prices, yeah, it can be, can be very profitable. Man, I wish I knew this stuff when I was like in school. Like there were times I worked at like gas stations, Toys <laughs> R Us when I was younger and I, I didn't even know this whole reselling world existed. So it's just really cool when you hear a story like that because just, I, I, I'm sure like nobody, like people are probably wondering like, what is this guy doing? Like, why is he buying <laughs> our books? Like, what right. is he up to? So yeah, thanks for, thanks for sharing that story. So fast forward, you know, you would quit your job, you were doing the books and stuff, you moved into R RA, which is retail arbitrage and, and wholesale. Let's kind of talk about how your business works nowadays. So, you know, retail arbitrage, that's the act of, you know, I don't know if you do it differently, but a lot of people think of it as going to stores like Walmart, Target, buying items and then flipping it for a profit you know, on, on Amazon with retail arbitrage, are you just going to these different stores and stuff or is your model a little different? 
Yeah, I mean, it's it's similar, very similar to that. We're going to the stores like you mentioned, and we we found like some smaller local stores that work really well for us too. What we, we try to make sure we're building relationships with the store employees and the store managers, and then oftentimes they'll give us a heads up on really good deals they have. Sometimes they'll work with us if we're buying a certain amount of product, they'll give us additional discounts. And then we also sometimes we'll do like evaluations of the products that are in the ads. We have some virtual assistants who help us do evaluations of those, and then we can look at what they're selling and we make lists of products to buy. But yeah, we're, I mean, we're not doing anything super crazy with retail arbitrage. We just have people that are dedicated to it 100% of the time. We go out there every day and we find a lot of product uh, as a result of the uh, amount of time we're spending on it to a large degree. So a lot of people lately are saying that retail arbitrage is dead and that you can't make money with it or, you know, People are saying it's a lot more challenging now with brand restrictions and categories mm -hmm. gating off and different things like that. Would you recommend to somebody, you know, think back to when you were just getting started selling books, you, mm -hmm. you might not have even known about retail arbitrage. If you were able to talk to your younger self, would you say, hey, Ryan, you know, get into RA right now? Or would you say with someone who's brand new right now, it's not the best opportunity, rather go with wholesale or rather go with something else? What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I, I still think that retail arbitrage is a good starting point to get your feet wet. It doesn't necessarily mean it's the right angle forever, but I still think it's one of the best ways to learn the process of selling on Amazon. You get to figure out what things sell for. You get to learn about how return on investment work, how the Amazon fees work, how sales rank works, how important reviews are. You just get to learn about all of these different aspects and you get to try it out in a very low risk way. So I still think retail arbitrage is a great way to get started. As you mentioned, there's some other, there's some new challenges. There's more brand restrictions today. There's more sellers today than four or five years ago. But I still, I know people who've gotten started within the past few months and they're still, they're seeing results already. So I, I still see it as a great spot to get started. And then maybe you do retail arbitrage for two to three months. And then from there, you take a step back and be like, okay, is this the way I want to do this business? Or does wholesale or private label or something like that appeal to me more? But I, I still think retail arbitrage makes sense because you can invest $100, you can invest $1,000 in product, see how it sells, see if you like it. And then it's kind of like a low barrier to entry way to right. test something out. You don't have to order a $5,000 order of product from China and it's either kind of an all, it's really good or you might get stuck with the whole batch. So yeah, I still think it's the way to get started. It's still a big part of my business. So that's, that's kind of my thoughts there. Do any bundling when it comes to retail arbitrage, doing wholesale bundles and stuff like that? We don't do too many bundles. We do some multi-packs where we'll sell like multiples of the same SKU. So it could be like three tubes of toothpaste instead of one, but we're not doing too much of where you'd mix two different products and together in a bundle. Right. Okay, cool. So, so you do some of the multi-packs. Why would you, why would you want to sell, you know, a three pack instead of just a one pack for the people who are listening? There's a couple of reasons. I mean, one is the higher the price point, the less impact the fees have on Amazon, particularly the fulfillment fees. So if you're selling an item for $9 or $19, the fulfillment fees are roughly the same. And then the other reason is sometimes the prices don't scale. Like the one pack might be $5 and the three pack is $20, which doesn't make any logical sense. You could just buy three of the one pack <laughs> for $15, but the three pack is selling for $20. People do uh, it, huh? Yeah, that type of thing is happening. So I basically like any product we're selling, we'll evaluate it as a one pack, a two pack, a three pack, a four pack, and we'll sell it as any of those listings that make sense to sell on, we'll sell on if the, if the margins are there, even if it seems like, okay, if I took the one pack times three and that would be cheaper than buying the three pack for, for some reason it doesn't, uh, people don't necessarily do the math. So yeah, those are a couple main reasons. Yeah. Amazon's an amazing place where you, you just look around and you're like, why is this even selling? How is it selling so much? Like people, why are people doing that? But it's, it's crazy. I mean, Amazon has how many, how many monthly users do they have? Isn't it like, is it like oh, a couple billion or something views or something per month? It's crazy, right? But with yeah, it's an insane number. <clears throat> yeah. So I forgot to mention, guys, if you are enjoying this and you want to follow Ryan, he does have a blog. It's online selling experiment.com. And I was just complimenting him before. It's a beautiful blog. He's got a, a lot of really awesome content over there 
coaching programs, some, some eBooks, programs, courses, stuff like that. And a lot of free content. So be sure to go over to online selling experiment.com to check him out. But moving forward, what are your thoughts on, you know, the wholesale business model versus retail arbitrage? And when you take a look at your business, you know, the 3.7 million in sales in 2017, is a lot of that coming from RA or is, you know, is it just a little slice of it coming from wholesale and kind of what direction are you moving? Yeah. So for 2017, we were, by the end of the year, our spend was almost equal between retail arbitrage and wholesale, oh, wow. I would say. Yeah. So we're right about 50-50 as it sits today um, of where those sales are coming from. In terms of going forward, we still, I mean, the retail arbitrage is primarily outsourced. So it's not taking time away from, from me. And then wholesale though, that's where we're really focusing on growing. All right. We're, we, we have a little bit of room to grow there, but we've kind of, we've, max that out without adding significantly to the manpower or the amount of ground right. that we that we'll cover. So I see a little bit of growth happening there for us, but wholesale is where we're really focusing on growing. And that's I mean wholesale has been great because we can we can set up the accounts with suppliers and then we can order the products again and again and again as opposed to retail arbitrage where a lot of times we'll just sell something once. Well man. So one thing you had mentioned, which I know is going to pique a lot of people's interest is the fact that you have, and I don't hear this often. I, I don't hear these two words connected very often and it's retail arbitrage and outsourced. You said that your retail arbitrage business is mostly outsourced, which means Ryan has people that are going out essentially shopping for him, bringing, bringing back the products. And I'm assuming you have a warehouse or something and you, yeah. you ship them all out. So how in the world have you been able to go from, you know, a guy selling books at a school, you know, entrepreneur club to, you know, having a whole, you know, I don't know how many, a whole fleet. What do you have multiple people going out shopping for you and, and sending into FBA? Yeah. I mean, my team today is there's eight people and there's two main guys that like retail arbitrage is their full-time responsibility. There's a couple other guys who help with it from time to time. And then there's people who basically it's their sole responsibility. One guy's sole responsibility is to list everything for sale and then manage our shipping team. So basically everything that comes into the warehouse, they're responsible. I hate that job. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. There's a reason I don't do it anymore. Um, <laughs> yeah. Why don't but, you do it, Ryan? You should go help him out right now. Yeah. No, I mean, it's, it's a good fit for him or for the guy on my team that's doing it. But yeah, sure, it's, sure. Uh, it's uh, not for everybody. But yeah, so that's, that's kind of an overview of like what people are doing today. But in terms of going from a, from one person to getting to this point, basically I would look at the tasks that were taking up the most time and also like what, what I had the ability to outsource or like what processes I felt like I could do more of with more time than just me. So pretty early on, the first, the first role I actually hired for was having people buy product for, for me because I'm like, this process is working for me. I'm able to find enough product in stores to the, to the point where I, if I could go 80 hours a week, which I, I guess technically I could, but I wasn't, I wasn't willing to do that, that I would be able to buy more products. So I w hired people, paid them basically a percentage of, at, at, at that time I was paying them a percentage of the profits on the items that sold that they purchased. So yeah, that was kind of the first hire I made. And then from there, it started to be too much product coming in and just a ton of time was going to ship and getting the products prepared to go to Amazon FBA warehouses. So then I decided to bring some people on to help do that processing to get the items shipped to Amazon. So they would help take stick price stickers off items, do any prep work, put them in poly bags, do the boxing and shipping to Amazon. So that was... I brought those individuals on in about uh, September of 2014 through January of 2015. And then September of 2014 is when I moved into the first warehouse that I had. That was about a 735 square foot space. And that was, it was great to get everything out of the house. And that allowed me to bring people on board as well. Cause I didn't want, I didn't want everybody working from my house. Yeah. So basically I got to the point where I hired some buyers and that was generating results. So then I wanted to hire more people to buy via real, retail arbitrage. That led to more products needing to be shipped out. So I'd hire more, more people shipping more uh, or at yeah. least more, more hours. And then that got to the point where that was all up and running and it really didn't take a ton of time. And I wanted to continue to expand the business, diversify into other income streams. So we're not as reliant on any one store. So then that's kind of when we started into the wholesale process and we started reaching out to 
manufacturers, distributors. Did you have a question there? Oh no, man. I'm just, I'm just taking it all. I was just like, that's so cool. Like just like seeing the whole like transformation. That's awesome. So you moved on and you didn't want to, you know, be relying on, you know, what if you couldn't sell that brand or what if you exactly. got kicked out of that store or something happened? So you moved on to suppliers, reaching out to manufacturers. You know, one thing that, that interests me is the fact that, you know, you hired somebody to go out shopping for you. No, you know, that's a, that's a, for someone out there who, you know, I've got a lot of friends who they go out 30, 40 hours a week and there's <laughs> just so much right. knowledge that they have. How did you take such a big job? Or maybe that's a limiting belief. Maybe it's not that big of a job. How did you train somebody to go out and essentially be you? You know what I mean? Like there's so right. many, just imagine like taking out a piece of paper and writing down like 95 things that like I would need them to consider. So was it a very slow process at first? You took them out, you would watch them, you would let them do their thing and then you would kind of quiz them or check them. Like what was that process? How did that work? Yeah. Yeah. That's a good question. I tried to boil it down before I ever got anybody involved to like, what are the key metrics or what are my key decision points that I'm deciding on whether I'm deciding to purchase an item or to leave it behind. And basically I've, there's so many things you can look at, but there's only a few that really move the needle in my opinion. So I was willing to, so my goal was to boil that down to something that's as simple as possible. So maybe there's three or four checks where those are, if it meets all of these things, it's get, it gets bought. If it doesn't, okay then it doesn't. So like the, some of the main things we look at are like sales rank, return on investment, the number of sellers on the item, how many reviews there are. And then we'll look at the price history charts a little bit as well. I like Keepa, Keepa and CamelCamelCamel.com for those. But outside of that, nothing else like really moved the needle. So basically I set up parameters for each one of those categories. And then the buyer is responsible for checking those things. So I would give them, we would walk, oh. like before we would go through, go to the stores, we'd walk through, okay, for every item that we scan, these are the things we're going to be checking. If it meets them all, do buy it. If it doesn't, don't. And then we set up, depending on where it falls in like the return on investment versus cost uh, versus sales rank, we'll set up like how many to purchase as well. And then basically we'd go to the stores with them a few times, or I would go to the stores with them a few times. And then from there, see how they could do. And then the, you mentioned like a quiz, but for me, the quiz was, are you bringing back products that fit the guidelines or not? And then were if you, they're buying- were you tagging them, were you tagging them somehow? So you knew like they, they were the one, like you would put a certain like code in with the SKU or something. Exactly. Yep. So we, yeah, we use inventory lab for our listing. And then for the supplier field, we'll add in the initials of the person who buys it. And then we know exactly what the, how well those products sell and what the return on investments are. Buying guidelines that we use for the buyers, it doesn't take into account everything that I would evaluate on certain buys that we do, but it, it's good enough that it's gonna be profitable over time. It's profitable. It buys the vast majority of things that I would buy and it doesn't take my time. So even if they're able to do 80% or 50, even 50% of what I could do, it doesn't take any time for me and I can pay it in a way that makes sense for them, makes sense for me, and is just a win-win overall. And in reality, they're probably at this point, some of these guys have been doing this for over two years now. They're probably doing this way better than I ever was. So that math that justifies it on the front end now is like they're, they're better at it than I ever was. So yeah, it's worked out really well. So I'm going to ask a question that I'm not actually thinking myself, but I know I could 100% guarantee that someone's going to ask <laughs> this in the comments and it's going to go yeah. something along the lines of, well, if I hire somebody, then why why would they give it to me and not just sell it themselves? So you know it was coming, man. <laughs> right. Yeah, that's a that's a common question. I mean, there's a few things that I would say to that. The first is we do we have a contract in place with these individuals oh. where it's like a, a non-compete. Yep. So basically they can't it's not extremely restrictive, but it says that they can't something, yeah. Yeah, it, it provides some protection there. The other thing I would say is not everybody has the motive the same motivation. Some people want to have the ability to get paid by someone else and not have the own, not be worried about if the items actually sell. So the motivations are, are huge. Like a lot of people have more of an employee mindset or even like a salesperson mindset where they want a commission on the sale, but they don't want all of the financial risk. So I think the mindset of the person that you're hiring is really important to this. And the other thing is like, if you want to make retail arbitrage a full-time thing, it requires a decent amount of capital. Like you can definitely scale it up over time. I mean, that's what I did. But if somebody wants to make a full-time income, they're going to need probably five or $10,000 that they can spend every month. Yeah. 
and most people aren't going to have that right away, especially like we're, we're working primarily with like college aged and just graduated high school or not high school, just graduated college. So right in that age range. So for the most part, those people aren't going to have the capital to do it. And then the, right. the final piece I would say is just because you know how to buy the right things doesn't necessarily mean you know how to do the rest of the process. There's still quite a few gaps, how to ship the products in, how to manage pricing, how to make sure you're not paying too much in storage fees, getting all the items shipped. I mean, it's just, there's, there's a lot of moving pieces so far. I mean, I've been doing this. I've had people buying for me for like about uh, almost four years now. And so far it haven't been any issues and overwhelmingly it's been positive. I mean, I'm sure there's cases where it's not where you teach somebody and it's happened where they're going to end up doing it on their own. But if you set things up right on the front end, you evaluate what that what motivates that person, what their goals are for the future. You can kind of tell if they want the business. If they don't, you get a contract in place that provides some protection. I think it'll work out just fine. Cool, man. Well, like I'm so tempted to keep diving into this because I have so many questions, but I have like so many other questions. So I'm going to just keep it flowing. So I'm apologizing to everybody listening, watching. I know like I could go into like hiring and scaling and like biggest mistakes. Like I know that you probably had so many challenges with like people doing things that you were like, uh, but I'm going to keep moving. I'm going to keep moving. Cool. So you were able to scale your business 3.7 million in 2017, which is huge. We can talk maybe about profit margins and stuff in a little bit, but what would you say are, were some of the keys, you know, from going to maybe a hundred thousand to a million, a million to two to three, obviously hiring and outsourcing had to be one of the biggest things because you already said, you'd have to be working 80 hours a week. And now you probably would have to be working every second of the day and plus more. Yeah. At this point. So yeah, Go ahead. I was going to say, yeah. Anything other than outsourcing and hiring that you think has helped to lead you to, you know, being able to get to where you are today. Yeah. I mean, that one's massive. So you, you hit it, you hit the nail on the head there, but I couldn't do anywhere close to this in the setup that I have today without the team that I have. Um, outside of that, the biggest thing that's allowed me to grow relatively quickly has been just continually reinvesting the money in the oh, business. Wow. Like I haven't, I've taken some money out now, but like for literally like the first two years, I would put just about everything back in from every single Amazon deposit back into inventory above and beyond like what I would Why need for taxes. That? Why? Yeah. To be able to com continually compound returns and just keep the cash. Cause I wanted to grow this business to a level that I could step away basically and have, it needs to get to a certain point to get to a level where you can have the overhead of having multiple team members doing all of these things and still have enough margin to be left over. So that was kind of my goal from the beginning. So I wanted to get it to a level where I can have all of these additional team members. Um, and the fastest way to do that without taking a loan is to continually um, reinvest from the beginning. And yeah, I mean, so far I've got Basically, it's gotten to this level. I've never taken an official loan. There's been a couple times in like the December timeframe where I'll spend more on credit cards than yeah. what I actually have available in the bank, just because that's the best time of the year to be selling. The demand is massive, but I would always pay the, even on those times, I would pay that off before the interest, before any interest would accrue. So that's been massive as well, just continually compounding returns, because this literally started with about five grand in cash. And then now after about four and a half years, this is the level that it's at. Yeah, and that's so cool. Yeah, so that's, a lot of people ask like, <laughs> when can I start taking money out of the business? Or how much can I take out of the business? And I'm like, well, the answer is you can take out as much as comes in as soon as you want, but that's to your detriment. So your goal, the long, yeah. Exactly, so it's basically, what's your long-term goal? And if your long-term goal is big, the more money you can keep in the business, the longer, the better off you're going to be. So yeah, that's been, that's been huge. Outsourcing has been huge. We've continued. One kind of thing is I, my goal is to like figure out a process, make, figure out how it works, outsource it, move on to the next thing that brings in money while continuing to do the first thing. So that's what we've done with retail arbitrage. That's what we're doing with wholesale. We'll continue to do that in other aspects as well. So I think that focus and focusing on one thing at a time or just a couple things at a time has been big as well. There's been times so in the me, past. Let me, let me stop Go you ahead. there really quick because that was really interesting. You, as a business owner, you're learning something new in your business that can help you to grow, generate more mm -hmm. sales, more leads. Then, So you're learning how to do it. Then you're creating a system for it and then hiring somebody and then moving on. 
Because that was big. So that was really, really big. What you just said right there is that is that accurate of what kind of what you do? Top level that's, stuff. Exactly. That's the that's the approach. Cool, man. Sorry, so. I, I know I kind of interrupted <laughs> you, but I was just like that was like you just like dropped a huge gold nugget. I'm just like wait a second. Yeah. No. Ooh. That's that's definitely good to underscore. So yeah, I appreciate you doing that. Because in the past, I've I've learned that to some degree the hard way. There's there was a time where I was trying to do retail arbitrage, online arbitrage, wholesale, private label, and had those all moving to some degree at the same time. And it led to everything suffering. When I focused on one thing, systematized, then moved on to the next thing, that's when that's when things really started to go well. And that's, I mean, that's still the approach that I'm working on today. The goal is to figure, be working on something new. Like my, I see myself as kind of like the tester, what, figuring out where the next opportunities are for the business. And then the other members of my team, their goal is to operate and continue to grow the areas that we already have systems for. So from my understanding, you're you're reinvesting your money back into the business because you want to continue to grow the revenues, grow the profits. And it sounds like your end goal is to have enough profit left over to where you could hire managers to really kind of do all the different things that you're having to do. And you're just kind of like at the top of the pyramid in a sense, like testing out, trying new things, like make sure the numbers are good. And the, you got management going over operations, management over mm-hmm. finances. I mean, I don't understand the full structure of like, mm-hmm. like, a, like, a, like a business like that. Or are there different pillars that you're trying to like eventually hire management out for? Yeah. I mean, to some degree, it's at this point today, like there's the way that my team looks, if we went kind of like top down is there's me. And then I've got like a, a COO slash operations manager, whatever you want to call him. But he's responsible for all the day to day of the Amazon business. So he manages the team. He he does the pricing. He's responsible for really everything uh, uh, with that. And then there's all all the other people. Then there's like three or four. There's four full time guys that are below him. And then there's two, one of them is responsible for getting everything listed, managing the shipping team. One of them works mainly on wholesale, and then two of them work primarily on full time retail arbitrage buying. And then we've got about four part time people at the moment who help ship all the products out, do the prep work. They'll help us list stuff on eBay and things like that. So then that's like the Amazon side of the team. And then I've got myself. And then there's one guy that helps me. And we work more on like the online selling experiment side. And then we're testing out, at the moment, we're testing out about a year ago, I bought an existing Shopify site. And we're kind of testing out building up demand for our own products outside of Amazon. So that's kind of what we're testing at the moment in addition to like online selling experiment where we do like we do some coaching and consulting and that's that's stuff I'm working on too. So the goal is to continue to systematize and outsource that side of the business too. And so yeah, that's that's a little yeah. bit of a overview yeah, there. It's, yeah, it's cool, man. I appreciate you sharing it. And it's just fascinating to kind of hear the structure of somebody's business and how it all works. So uh, you do have the blog. Do you have any like YouTube presence or Facebook or anything like that that people can follow you at? Yeah, I do I do have a, loot, a YouTube channel as well. Uh, don't have a ton what of, is it? <laughs> there's a link to it on the top of my site. I should. I don't even. Yeah, don't, don't worry. We'll we'll yeah. we'll link it up in the in the show notes below. But uh, yeah, good. man. Yeah, that's. I mean, so, and then but online selling experiment. There's links to the other spots that I am, but that's really the the main spot. I'm not as active on social media, and that's kind of been a conscious decision as well. I've got sucked in in the past that. where it's. Uh, I don't blame you, man. It's yeah. It's kind of a black hole. But yeah, the, the website's the main spot to find me. And yeah, there's links to everything else there too. Cool, man. So I got a couple more questions I wanted to ask you. I, I'm really, really grateful to have you on the show. And I know a lot of people are probably like, wow, like this is awesome to like, like kind of hear what it's like from the CEO of a, a million dollar business. So what are your typical profit margins that you can expect and that others can expect? I know yours are probably a bit smaller having more overhead warehouse employees. What's, what's a good actual profit margin that the average person could look for when it comes to retail arbitrage items and wholesale from your experience? At the end of the day, like if they're at a net profit, like if it's one person before you've hired people, if you're at a net profit of between about 20 and 25%, I think that's a pretty healthy range. It depends on what you're sourcing and what your buying guidelines are. So it could definitely be higher or lower depending on what that looks like. But I think like 20 to 25% net after all fees, after everything, is a very reasonable target to aim for. Like for my business today, we're closer to, and we're, we've been growing, like we invested in a bigger 
warehouse space, building out the team. Yeah, like we're closer to the, we're in the ballpark of 10% is in terms of our net margins. So that, that gives you an idea. It, it goes down a little bit as you continue to bring on people, but the actual, the absolute dollars in terms of sales volume goes up at the same time. So it's kind of a, it depends on how you look at it. But yeah, I'd right. say that yeah. those are kind of good ways to look at that. And then for people, yeah, for people when like the retail arbitrage side, when we're initially evaluating products, we're typically looking for 50% return on investment or greater. So if we spend $10, we want to get paid $15 after all fees, after all shipping, that means a profit of five. And then five oh, divided by that $10 buy cost is a 50% return on investment. That'll get you in the ballpark of a 25% net profit most of the time. And then wholesale, we go a little bit lower in terms of return on investment percentage there. Our general rule is not lower than 30% return on investment. But if it's really like if it's a really hot seller, low return rates, things like that, especially if it's a higher dollar item, we'll consider going lower than that. But yeah, I'd say going for 30% ROI on wholesale, 50% return on investment for retail is a good starting point for most people. For, for your wholesale business, are you going to like distributors and suppliers? Are you trying to build relationships directly with the brand? I don't know if you're familiar with Dan and Eric from the Wholesale Formula, mm -hmm. but they're like really big into kind of like building relationships and adding value to brands and like working directly with them. Are you going the brand route? Or are you going the kind of like wholesale websites, distributor route? We do both. And we've actually had brand brands is preferred because then the closer you can get to the source the better but we've actually had some good results with distributors too just because a lot of them represent multiple companies or they'll represent multiple product lines so we target in multiple different ways but if we find a product that's selling well on amazon we reach out to them and it's a, we find the distributor as opposed to the actual brand owner that's fine so we, we do work with both Sustainability and long-term growth. There's a lot of people who are wondering, you know, is Amazon going to be around for the next five, 10 years, retail arbitrage, wholesale. What are your thoughts on, you know, like the confidence of, of making money online and e-commerce? Do you feel like it's getting to the end or it's just at the beginning? And I have a feeling I'm pretty sure what you're going to say. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, I still think we're in the early days when it comes to online. I mean, Amazon's growing faster than it ever has. Purchases are shifting to online faster than they ever have. I mean, the fulfillment networks are getting more and more built out by the day to be able to get people things faster to the point where they're not even going to have to go online. More and more brick and mortar stores are closing or going bankrupt. It seems every couple months there's a new one. So I think e-commerce as a whole, the future is very bright. I think retail arbitrage, I think that's going to exist in some form or fashion for the next five to 10 years, at least. Maybe it's not as good on Amazon a couple of years down the road, or maybe it's not, maybe eBay becomes the next best marketplace for retail arbitrage, or maybe a new marketplace comes up. I think the marketplace could shift, but I think the act of going to one, like a retail store or one market, buying something low, selling it high somewhere else, I think that's here to stay. It's existed pretty much forever, in my opinion. So I think that's here to stay. Wholesale, I see that being a much, I see that being very safe for the future as well. But yeah, I'm, I'm very bullish on the food future of e-commerce. I think that's the direction the, the world is, is heading, especially the more and more people who've grown up with it now continue to get older, yeah. have more spending power. I just think being involved with e-commerce is a great spot to be. Cool, man. Awesome. And any final words of wisdom that you have for the people who are listening on iTunes, watching on YouTube, you know, they're looking to get started, they're excited, or maybe they're in their business trying mm -hmm. to scale. Any, any final words of wisdom that you have for these uh, folks listening and watching? Yeah, I guess final words of wisdom, I would say is take action on something that you've been wanting to try or take that next step. Most, for, the most, for most people listening, I think you probably know something that you know you wanted to try. You, probably, you maybe even tell people you want to try. I would say take that first step in making that happen. If you already have a business, I would say evaluate what you can outsource and basically ask yourself the question, is what I'm working on today, is that the highest value thing I can be doing for my business? And if the answer is anything but yes, which it probably isn't, because I, I'm still victim to this as well, I would look into ways that you can outsource and get somebody else involved and just begin to continue to grow your business by leveraging other people as well. And if you don't know what you want to do, but you know you want to like add some income, I mean, I'd encourage you to test out like maybe maybe retail arbitrage is it. Maybe you want to try to starting like a niche site. Just do something that gets you making money, gets your feet in the wet, get in the game. And then you can always adjust. Just because you start one thing doesn't mean you can't 
switch it up in the future. So that's that's a few Great parting words I would share there. Cool, Ryan. Well, it was <laughs> it was awesome to have you on the show, man. You dropped a lot of knowledge, and uh, you know I apologize, folks, because I just wanted to keep diving into certain <laughs> topics. Maybe we could get you on another time in the future, sure. later on in the year, and, and kind of see how things are going with your business. But yeah, if you guys enjoyed this show, be sure to like, comment, and subscribe. Smash that like button below. Go over to Ryan's blog over at onlinesellingexperiment.com. Go check it out. And uh, I think you guys will really enjoy everything that's going on over there. And uh, yeah, I just want to thank you guys so much for watching the video. Ryan, thank you so much for coming on. Good luck with the year, and I'll talk to you soon. Thanks, Thanks. Steve. Appreciate it.